was watching the video, Ethics, Morality, and Yarn, and I got a little angry. Alarm bells were going off. She didn't tell you, like, the most important thing that you need to know if these are issues you care about. <sighs> which means to me that it was just anger-mongering and fear-mongering, which is just not okay. It's not okay. Please stop, internet. Please stop. So I'm going to give you the information that you need if you actually honestly care about these things, because you have a solution. And I'm going to lead with it, so if you take nothing else away from this video, if you don't care about all the other incorrect facts that you were presented with, you need to know about GOTS, G-O-T-S, the Global Organic Textile Standard, which is a certification that every step of the process is both sustainable in material terms and human terms. You cannot have unfair labor practices and get got certified. You can't. Well, I mean, no, nothing is perfect. Caveat, nothing is perfect. But on the whole, that's their job. Their job is to, is to tell us that every part of this process is not harming the environment and it is not harming any people along the way. The good news is that in the US, there are 50 companies that are GOTS certified. Globally, in the yarn industry alone, globally, there are more than 2,000. And I'm gonna be fact checking, I'm gonna be giving you my facts right here so you can verify them for yourself. Because you, you can, in fact, because obviously child labor is bad. We know, we know this, that's, that's not news. <laughs> that we can do something about it is something I guess people don't know. So now you do. If you care about child labor, worker welfare, sustainable practice, only buy Got Certified Yarn. And that's probably as close as you're gonna get to good. We're also going to talk about a bunch of other stuff. We're going to talk about superwash. We're going to talk about merino because, <laughs> interestingly enough, when I did five minutes of research, it turns out that's actually your biggest problem. Second tip of the day, if you want to be as sustainable as possible, you're going to need to avoid merino. You're just gonna. We'll talk about why. We're going to talk about child labor. We're going to talk and if like actual child labor, instances of child labor in the yarn industry worker exploitation in the yarn industry, and the generals of wool production and other productions, including mule sing, which is complicated. It is complicated. So let's fact check, shall we? Child labor in the yarn industry. Now, I was unable to find any instances of such. We have lots of information on child labor in the textile industry. The Department of Labor in the United, I believe that's a United States thing, I'll have to double check that, but I believe it's a United States organization, but they keep track of this stuff, and we have known instances, none of which are in the yarn industry. Does that mean there aren't any? Technically, no, um, but the reason that I use Perplexity AI, which you're going to see the logo a lot of, so I figure I should tell you, the reason I use it is that it doesn't just search the web, it collates the web. So it's going through the entirety of the internet, deciding which is the most likely to be true answer, and giving that to me with its sources cited so I can verify that it is saying what it says it's saying. If perplexity can't find any instances of child labor in the yarn industry, it's highly unlikely that there are instances of child labor in the yarn industry, at least that we know of. We can't do much about things we don't know of. We can care about it. We can make every effort to do things and buy things that do not support that practice. Probably don't buy something that was woven in Ghana, um, if that's something you care about. Although it's a very complicated issue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm already torching my channel, so, you know. <laughs> Might as well tell you a story I love while I'm doing it. Bolivia is a country in South America that is impoverished. Yeah, like properly, it is, it's not great. There's problems. And kids work. One of the most common jobs that they do is on the buses, not buses, they're, they're like minivans. They're like little sort of minivans that people get on and when there's enough people, you go to the place that it says you're going to. It's how people get around the country. 
and children will be the ticket callers. And they'll call and they'll get people to come to that minivan and then they'll all take off and the kid will sit there doing his homework. And international law, international people made a big clamor and said, you, you have to stop child labor practices. I mean, fair enough, like nobody wants kids to work. But the kids in Bolivia were like, excuse me, but if we don't work, we're not gonna eat. And we kinda wanna eat. So they unionized. I mean, how awesome is that? How fabulous is that? Children in Bolivia unionized to combat people from outside of Bolivia coming in and telling them how to run their lives. Does that mean that child labor is okay? No, of course it doesn't. But it does mean that life is complicated and we don't always have all of the information or all of the answers. So maybe the best thing that we as humans can do is care, but maybe not be so judgy. Care and listen? That wouldn't kill us, would it? Anyway, enough about Bolivia. I wasn't able to find any. Again, that doesn't mean that there isn't any, but it's not as big of a problem as it is in the rest of the textile industry, where it is a problem. And if that's something that you care about, you do the research, you decide for yourself. Worker exploitation in the yarn specific industry. Again, I was not able to find any specific instances of this. The closest thing I was able to find was that Xinjiang in China produces one fifth of the world's cotton. They pick the cotton. And Xinjiang is a problem. It's a huge problem on a lot of levels because Xinjiang is where there's a Hui minority, uh, well, they're the majority in Xinjiang, but they're a minority in Chinese culture. They are the Muslim Chinese people. And Hui or Han people, who are the majority Chinese people, don't always like them very much. There's a problem there. There's also a problem in China in general, what I would call a problem. It might not be a problem, I don't know everything, but for me, it's not really okay that if you express uh, sentiments that are against the Han majority, you may very well find yourself in a worker re-education camp in a cotton field. That's not great to me. So, if you are concerned about worker rights and, and worker fairness, you're probably gonna want to avoid Chinese cotton which is gonna be hard to tell, so you might want to avoid cotton altogether. Superwash. Superwash is, you know, it's plastic. So first and foremost, yes, it's plastic. Sometimes. And the good answer is sometimes. The good answer is that society progresses and we are making strides into different ways of, of creating a yarn where the wool scales will not lock together and it will not felt that do not involve plastic. Um, a couple of the names of the processes, they're going to be here. You're going to want to Google this because I don't understand all of it. I am not a scientist. I am a social studies teacher. Um, one of them is called EXP. Another one is plasma something, which is actually really cool. It's something like it's 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 like an electrostatic charge that messes with the hair follicle. So all you're using is is air and electricity. So definitely not in the harmful chemical range. Um, speaking of chemicals, though, just a little aside. Everything is made of chemicals. Chemicals are not de facto bad. Water is a chemical. Like. <laughs> That, that would be a good thing for us to maybe chill out about. Chemical does not de facto mean toxic. It doesn't. There are a bunch of different new processes in which you can make superwash non-toxic, in which you, and non-plastic and sustainable, and all of the good adjectives that we want in our things. And most of them are either GOTS certified or say it on the label. So they are advertising it it is findable. If these are things that are important to you, then look for that. It is absolutely possible to do. It might be out of budget to do, but it is absolutely possible to do. Um, and again, th look, there's no right and wrong answer, right? There, there are problems in the world and we want to solve them all and we can't. 
we, we just can't. It would be great if we could, but we can't. But we can make a difference. We absolutely can make a difference. And our choices make a difference. And emailing companies and saying, hey, are you guys certified? If you have a favorite yarn brand and they aren't, what does it hurt to get everybody you know to shoot an email? And if they get enough emails, they might say, hey, maybe we'll sell more yarn if we do this. It doesn't hurt to try. And there are, so those are the things that you can do. It is not necessarily an insurmountable problem. Are we going to change the world tomorrow? Probably not. I wish we could. That's about the only thing that this woman said that I agreed with is that there is no such thing as entirely sustainable yarn. Everything in life is a compromise. And that is what it is. We shouldn't have expectations other than that. But again, we do have good options and we should educate ourselves about what those options are so we can do the best that we can. So we have available superwash that is non-toxic. I did do some research on acid dyes as well because I was curious about that. Because, I mean, the dyeing process is... It sounds... You know what? It sounds bad. That doesn't mean it is bad. Just because something seems to be true doesn't in fact make it true. That's called confirmation bias, and I try to avoid that. So, it, uh, so I checked, right? I was like, is that actually bad? Um, it turns out acid dyes are not that bad. In the grand scheme of toxicity, acid dyes are one of the lower impact. Um, it's not zero impact. Nothing in life is zero impact. Walking out your front door is not zero impact. But in the grand scheme of things, it's on the lower end of the spectrum. Again, you make the choices you want to make, but if you are doing everything else, but you want pink, is that a bad decision? I mean, only you can look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. But if you have thought about, you know what? If you've thought about your choice, whatever that choice is, if you have honestly thought about it, not, I don't care, not, I have just some generalized idea, but if you've actually properly researched and thought about your choice and made the best decision for you, the balance of being a human and being alive and the time that you have and the money that you have and caring about the world, just make the best decision you can. That's all we can ever ask of anybody. It's all we can ask of ourselves. It's all we can ask of others. And it doesn't seem like it should be that hard. Musling. Mulesing. However you pronounce that word. Let's talk about mulesing. First and foremost, mulesing is almost entirely an Australian problem. The reason it's almost an entirely an Australian problem is that what it is, is a thing designed to prevent flies from laying their eggs in the butts of sheep, sorry, it's just what it is, um, which leads to infestations obviously both of flies and of maggots, which is not great if you're a sheep. Mulesing is the way that it has been prevented since the 1930s, so for almost 100 years. There are people trying to come up with better ways of doing it. Mulesing is basically scarring the area, so it makes it inhospitable. Infestation of flies and maggots, A, is probably not pleasant. That, that can't be fun. Uh, but it can also kill the sheep. I don't know how, but I do know that. Again, verify me. So, this is one of those questions that doesn't have an easy answer. There are laws in Australia that apparently, I, and how they can make this statistic, I don't know, but allegedly 90% of sheep farmers in Australia who practice mule sing, uh, give medication. They give them painkillers to make it less problematic. And then there are others who are trying many of the alternatives, some of which they're trying to genetically breed it out of the sheep or use sheep that are not it because it turns out that the breed that is most hospitable to flies is Merino. So, if you don't want to get wrapped up in it, just don't buy Merino. Because it seems that that's the breed that is it, it, that you have to do it for. Um, there are other practices. They are semi-effective. So I'm going to leave this one to the professionals. 
I don't know enough, even doing research, I don't know enough. It's one of those complicated questions that do I want to dive into? What percentage of sheep die from maggot and fly infestation? Do we have any data on, are they always like uncomfortable and trying to mess with the area if they are infested with flies? I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. There's too much that I don't know and I'm not willing to make a decision on that. Um, to a certain extent, I have to trust the farmers because at the end of the day, it is not in a farmer's best interest to kill his sheep unless he's killing it for meat, but to harm his sheep. So while I am sure there are instances of animal cruelty, I am sure that people are sometimes jerk faces, most people are not. And most people are trying to run their business and trying to survive and, and do their thing. So to a certain extent, for me personally, I'm gonna set that question aside um, I mean, in fairness, actually, it's kind of a, a moot point, A, because I don't live in Australia, B, because the only Australian yarn that I have access to that I, in fact, like is Queensland brand, who are GOT certified. They are Muesling free. Muesling, Muesling free, whatever the word is, they are that free. So I feel okay buying from them because they have made a choice that they want to be in this direction. So I can safely buy that yarn, should that be a concern for me. Again, finding out, if you decide you don't like it, if it's not cool for you, that's your choice. You can absolutely decide that. It takes a minute to Google or to perplexity. I, I recommend perplexity. And, and check, is this brand doing the things that I want? Yes or no? And then you decide. It, it's really, it's, we have options. We, we have some power here and we can use that power. So we have an Australian problem and a Merino problem that's too big for me to answer. I, I, you know, I don't know which is more painful for the, for the sheep. Um, the other thing that I found very, very weird, and this is where I started, I started getting angry, was talking about sheep farming as though there were such a beast as a wool production factory, like owning sheep solely for the production of wool. That doesn't exist. The reason that doesn't exist is because it would be economically unviable. It is not commercially feasible to have a sheep farm for the sole purpose of raising of, of yarn. So where we get our fiber is from milk production facilities, meat production facilities. That's their primary focus. There is, to the best of my knowledge, I was unable to find such a beast because it, it doesn't make financial sense. It costs way more. They get usually in the area of two dollars a kilo for fleece and it costs hundreds of dollars in food and hundreds of dollars in purchase price and hundreds of dollars in um, veterinary care and shearing and all of the things that it costs to do are very expensive. So it's you, there's no such thing. I, I don't know what she was talking about but that doesn't exist. So in the grand scheme of types of yarn, um, I did read a couple of the comments. One commenter was talking about bamboo and that the only way to put bamboo into yarn is by a process that is unenvironmentally friendly and I forgot to check, so I'm gonna check that now. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so you can make bamboo yarn without using chemicals. You can make bamboo yarn at home if you want. <laughs> you sort of pulp, you do pulp it, but you can pulp it by soaking it and basically soaking it and then doing a mashed potato situation and then cutting it and heating it and then you can spin it. Oh, no, you need amine oxide, which you can use at home, but I don't know what that is. Let's find out. Oh, okay. and it's not recording. Don't know why. Sorry about that. So the, the bamboo is, if you're interested in various sustainable fibers, you might want to check out bamboo and see if the process is okay for you, uh, if the chemicals, etc., etc., are in your sort of moral realm. That's up to you. You know how to do the research because you're smart. Ending where we started, gots. 
When in doubt, just buy guts. It is not... It is complicated. It's very complicated. But it doesn't have to be so complicated that you can't do anything about it. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this leads you down a path towards an ever so slightly better life. See you later. <laughs>